month long workshop for neurotypical suspension limitation. Second is more of the environment uh, organized by Matthew Lewis, Julie Simpson, uh, my summer at me. So, guys, please pay attention to this. Everybody welcome to apply. By the way, it is in the line, it is actually very soon. It's not up to us, it's up to KPP, so please apply, even if it's just in the email of it. But then we will go to the record. And the, the rule of this workshop is not a conference. Basically, you come in for a certain period of time, the minimum time is about two weeks, and uh, 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 correct. Uh, you need to come for a certain period of time, it's only one extra day, and the rest of the time you can walk to the other side. Yes, the authors, you can pass the people, it's a big production, it's a big environment. I'd like you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. I will take any more time from the speaker. <coughs> uh, the speaker is Michael Dickinson. So, uh, I've been part of the faculty at the University of Chicago, the University of University of Washington, and Well, I, I, like everybody, I want to thank the, um, the, the organizers for um, in, in inviting me, um, especially since I, I, I can't really say that I'm a card-carrying member of the olfaction community, um, but it's, it's great to uh, be at least a temporary member, <clears throat> and uh, I'm learning a lot. It's like drinking from a, from a fire hose. Um, <clears throat> so I want to talk about... Um, about the natural behaviors of flies and the role that um, that, that olfactory play, uh, behaviors play in, in certain aspects. And so just as a very brief in introduction, very similar to what Bill Hansen said a few days ago, just to give you a little bit of the, sort of the what motivates me as, as a scientist, especially for this particular problem. Um, I mean, you've probably all seen pictures like this that show that at least from the perspective of, you know, biomass or species diversity, um, insects are the most successful radiation of organisms um, in, in, in the history of life, as, as Bill mentioned. Uh, what Bill didn't mention is sort of what zoolo why zoologists think insects are so successful. And, and, and most would say, would say this, it's, it's flight. Um, flight evolved exactly four times in the history of life. Each event was uh, associated with a, a remarkable uh, a subsequent radiation most uh, prominently in insects, but also in birds, bats, and pterosaurs. Uh, pterosaurs weren't all these, you know, giant um, scary things. Most were about the size of, of pigeons, and they were extraordinarily diverse before they, um, they, they, they went extinct. And, and my, you know, most of my research career, I, I've studied flight, you know, basically because it's cool. Um, I, I think if I was put it a, a little more s scientifically, <clears throat> um, Flight really pushes the, the envelope of organismal design. So within um, um, flight systems, and by the way, this is a high-speed uh, video shot at 6,000 frames per second of two Drosophila that were on a collision course with one another. And here's a photo montage um, that shows that they can you know, exhibit a evasive maneuver within about uh, somewhere around one-fifth to one-tenth of, of the duration of a human eye blink. Um, and, and what we find within, within flight systems is the most powerful muscles that have ever existed, uh, the fastest visual systems, arguably, from the talks we saw today, the fastest olfactory systems. I mean, the list goes on and on because it, it just requires uh, specializations uh, to, 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 to fly. Um, <clears throat> and why fly? Well, the cost of transport is, um, is so low that it basically allows you to cover um, to carry your body mass a greater distance per unit time than any other form of, of terrestrial locomotion. Now, another thing that I think is really fascinating that's come from sort of modern day neurobiology is we're learning almost on a, on a daily basis as papers um, come out that, that the, the neural architecture of insects is, is astonishingly conservative. So we can find homologous neurons, homologous circuits, you know, families of neurons in animals as behaviorally different as social honeybees and, and, and fruit flies. And, 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 and I think that that, that, um, that, that conservation <clears throat> um, underscores behavioral modules that are very broad and very, very ancient. So we can find uh, navigational mechanisms in, 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 in ants, um, 
uh, monarch butterflies, dung beetles, and as I'll show you, fruit flies that are all actually using the same homologous circuits. And if we sort of think about that in terms of evolution, we have to go back between 450 to 400 million years ago when this great radiation took, took place um, that give, has given rise to these crown, these crown taxa. And, and so if there's one thing that's, in my mind, as cool as insects, it's time travel. And so what I really feel like we, what we try to do is to understand these behavioral modules because by understanding these behavioral modules that are common among insects, we're really getting a, a, a view of what, you know, this, which I think is one of the most important creatures that ever lived, you know, the, the early flying insect that forever changed the world, changed, you know, ecosystems, terrestrial ecosystems in, in, in just a, a radical way. We can, it, we, we get, kind of get to know this guy, you know, so it's like going back in the time machine. And, and to put this in a little bit of an analogy, um, this is pi. Does everybody know what pi is? Okay. Um, it's kind of interesting to look at these words. Pi is Proto-Indo-European. And so what linguists can do by looking at current languages is reconstruct. This is, these are English translations of Proto-European. They, they could put together vocab a vocabulary and sometimes even, in, even syntax of this ancient language in these you know, crazy societies that actually try to speak Proto-Indo-European. It sounds a little bit like Klingon if you've ever heard Klingon. Um, but, but it's the same sort of idea that, that you know, we, we get this you know, amazing view into this early culture by trying to reconstruct this ancient language. It just as I think we can reconstruct you know, this ancient creature at the very base of insects. So is there a Precambrian toolkit? <laughs> so <clears throat> yes, I, indeed there are. And I, I want to point out that this is one of people's favorite um, proposals for a, a fossil that might be very, very similar to the organism that, that was at the base of the, of the split between protostromes and deuterostromes. It's called Dickinsonia, which my wife, you know, she says, why are you so excited about this? Dickinsonia is usually described as like a, a, an enigmatic, gelatinous, brainless little worm. And I say true, but then, then that indicates that the ancient features are captured by some crown taxa. So <clears throat> it, it, it sort of supports you know, my general hypothesis. So, 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 so the, the, behavioral, the behavioral modules that I want to talk about have to do with how animals find food, and flight plays an important role because um, many ecologists have discussed these sorts of issues before, but, but, but search is really a multi-scale phenomenon. But, but within insects and, and, and other flying animals, the, the, that scale gets greatly expanded because you can fly. So you have a you have like long distance component long distance dispersal that can be from continent to continent that literally be, can be, say, in some birds from you know, near the North Pole to near the South Pole. Um, uh, and, and then there's a sort of often a sort of broad local search, um, sort of you know, you know, trying to find, in this case, you know, the, 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 the right uh, rotting uh, of fruit. And then once you find that, there's, there's often sort of a narrow local search of finding sort of the best uh, yeast spot with, within the fruit. And again, this is just outlined for fruit flies but you know, ecologists working on optimal foraging strategies have, have talked about these multiple scales for, for some time. But what I think is interesting as a neurobiologist is that different sensory cues are available you know, at, at different spatial scales. And, 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 and the brain has to use those sensory cues in, in a sort of scale appropriate, appropriate way. And that will be sort of a major theme. And just to put this in sort of pictorial sense, so imagine you know, a hungry fruit fly would first you know, want to try to find this this nice orchard, once it finds this orchard, it's gonna to wanna to find a tree that has a lot of good rotting fruit under it. It's gonna to have to pick one of those and you know, find which, uh, which outbreak <coughs> um, <coughs> growth of, of yeast it's gonna sample at, 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 at any given time. So I always like to try to give acknowledgement up at front, and I'm very, very happy and proud to have a you know, kind of a diverse uh, laboratory in, in, in all ways. And, I, and, and today I'm gonna to be highlighting um, the work of three people, of uh, Floris van Bruegel, who's, who's been in the lab and for a number of years now, he's now moved back to, uh, to Washington, Irene Kim, and especially Kate Leach, who's a, a new member of the laboratory, but, but, but has pioneered some research that I'm just about to talk about um, that required enormous amount of skills from sort of field marshal type skills to modeling skills and so forth. Um, so the, fir the first and most part of the talk is gonna be about long distance dispersal. Um, and also, I have to thank Massimo, who helped me get the money to do the experiments I'm, I'm about to talk about, as well as Flores and especially Kate. Okay, so a lot of my thinking on this was transformed by a reading of a paper 
uh, a while ago that was written by Jerry Coyne. Jerry Coyne is a very, very famous population geneticist. It was testing a, a conundrum proposed by Dobzhansky um, in the early part of the, the, the last century about why uh, disparate populations of, of, of Drosophila species were so genetically similar, even though they were, were thousands of kilometers apart. And, and at that time, people couldn't imagine that the flies could actually fly that far. So, so Coyne, in a series of papers with collaborators, did some remarkable experiments in Death Valley National uh, Monument, um, at, where they released, um, I'm kind of simplifying things, but released 60,000 sort of cosmopolitan Drosophila melanogastrin simulans at 6 p.m. one night from um, Sheep Creek Oasis and, and had banana traps in two oases uh, of 15 kilometers and about a seven kilometers away. And don't think of like camels and, 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 and palm trees and like, you know, sexy people on pillows oases. These are like little tiny fetid swamp oases, okay? Um, but, but nevertheless, um, remarkably, by, by 9 a.m. the next morning, 17 were caught 15 kilometers away in one direction, in about orthogonal direction. Another 17, coincidentally, were caught at Sheep Creek Spring. So these are animals traveling. We did put this in perspective. So roughly 10 kilometers a day. So you know, you've heard about this is the great Arctic turn that goes from you know, the, the northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere. It's traveling about 1.4 million body lengths a day. The monarch butterfly, another famous migrant, 2 million body lengths a day. This, tr this travel of 10 kilometers would mean 3 million body lengths for a fruit fly. Now, I've been talking about the experience for, uh, for a while. And um, this whole idea of the Tavonian toolkit um, which is this notion of all these ancient modules that this you know, proto-insect must have had. It was all sort of came from a review paper that I wrote that was that focused on these experiments. And a lot of people just say, you know, I just don't believe it. I don't believe that these, you know, so we start out to repeat them. Now, Death Valley is now a national park. We can't do the experiments there, but we found an experiment of halfway in place, halfway between Los Angeles and, uh, and, and, and Las Vegas. And, it, and you, know, you can see it's like a, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful place where you want to hang out where there are places called Mars, Zizix, um, Midway. I mean, it is, it, is, it is a really horrible place. Um, but there's this wonderful a, a white patch there um, called Coyote Lake, and I'll enlarge that. Um, and um, I've never seen any coyotes there, but actually the type species that gives this type of desert, it's like characteristic, like you know you're in this desert when you see this guy. This is a sun scorpion. Um, but actually, they're, don't worry, because they're not around during the day. They just come out by the thousands at night. But they're not true scorpions, so they don't have a poisonous tail. Instead, they have these nice, sharp, poisonous fangs. Um, <laughs> but I've been told that the next time we do these experiments, Massimo is, is, has, has volunteered to like, spend you know, keeping these away from our tent at night. Um, so so this, is, this enlargement of the view of, of Coyote Lake, and it's a dry lake bed, so there's no water. Um, and, and so we have a, a release site. We have a trap set up in two rings, a one kilometer, I mean, uh, sorry, a half kilometer ring and a two kilometer uh, a, a ring. Um, and this is what it looks like. Okay, it's just, it's absolutely unworldly. It looks like the opening sequence in Star Wars, effectively. Um, and here's Kate and Francesca and I setting up what we call bionic buckets, which are um, um, traps with a carefully engineered uh, surface. We can, with a, a, a Raspberry Pi computer, infrared lighting so we can, we can take pictures of the animals that land on the traps and then the, some of those animals actually go into the traps where, 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 where they get caught and we can count them later. Um, so it's a trap as Admiral Akbar says. And, and, and I, I don't have time to go into this but, but this is, the surface of this thing is really complicated. It's taken many months to get this right so that we can image on top of it yet it traps the flies. And this is why it's great to have a diverse laboratory because none of the male lugheads would know how to use this machine. Um, and this machine was absolutely essential for figuring out how to get this to work. And what we put in this trap is treetop apple juice, half a liter of treetop apple juice, and some uh, champagne yeast that are fermented for exactly two days. That's all that's in these things. OK, so here's what one of these traps look like. Michael, okay. is it yeah. I mean, we wanted to be as close as we could to the original experiments, and yes, there's less distractions, and it's just this big open surface. Um, but we need to do it in other places as well. So you can, the, the, the release site, so this is one of the traps a kilometer away. The release site, you can see enlarged there, there's two little objects. I think that if you enlarge, so we'll kind of take a magnification of that. And OK, no, I'm sorry, that's not <laughs> the release site. Actually, what that is, is one of these covered in a black plastic bag. So here's 30,000 flies ready to go. 
And I know what you're, gonna, you're thinking. Um, oh, yeah, we have a weather station, so we get wind direction, temperature, humidity, all these sorts of things. Um, yes, we count them. So we count them because Kate devised a really clever, we have these laser cut inserts that we put inside the fly bottles. The flies pupariate on these things. We can put a bunch of these things in one box and all the flies come out and then we can count this with machine vision or manually and so forth. So we know that we're within a couple thousand of 30,000. Okay, let me just get to results. So these are results. So um, we released about 25,000 flies in this experiment. This was the wind direction at the time of the release. These are the numbers of flies we caught in the traps at, in, the, in, the, in the half kilometer ring and the two kilometer ring. And we were, I'm sorry, we were just fucking surprised. We didn't think we'd catch anything. And we get all these flies. And, 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 and this is just displayed in kind of graphical, graphical form. Um, so I, I want to first talk about the, the, one, the, the, the traps that are one kilometer away from the release site. Uh, uh, because we fluorescently tag them um, with, with fluorescent powder. And, they're, and, and we don't need to, though. They're, 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 nothing lives. Well, no, OK. <laughs> There, I, I don't want to give I don't want to give my punchline away. There are no other Drosophila. We've never caught a, a Drosophila that wasn't ours. Okay, we have caught other things, but that comes later. Okay, so so this is just the number of flies on the traps with the camera system, um, from data from one trap, and remarkably, the data from different traps, regardless of wind direction, overlaps. So the flies are compensating for wind, which is sort of what they're supposed to do, but with, with, a, with a, a, a hitch, I'll show. So we also, we can kind of figure out from the number of flies we get that about half of the, you know, if a fly lands, if we see the fly with a camera, there's about a 50% probability that we will trap that fly within the next second or so. So anyway, I mean, that's not really important, but I want to overlay all the data from all the traps. And this is pretty remarkable. If I put this in terms of speed, and this is just using the distance directly from the release site to the trap, the first flies that get there must have flown at 6.5 kilometers per hour minimum because, you know, they might have waited for a while, right? And then even the kind of these slow pokes, they're still traveling fast. And then all the flies, like, they kind of get through. It's like a shock wave of flies that's done in 36 minutes. So just to put this in perspective, six kilometers per hour is about like a fast, brisk walk, okay? So if you had a pet fly, you could take it for, you know, a walk. Um, <laughs> OK, so again, these are the data. So how do we make sense of these data? And so Kate has been doing some modeling. So this is just a very, very simple model. And I know everybody's going to laugh at the plume model, but it doesn't really matter how sophisticated you make the plume model within this, you know, for the, for the results I'm going to describe. So here's the plumes um, <clears throat> coming from each, each trap. And then we do a simulation where we release a, a fly. And every time it crosses a plume, there's some probability that it'll detect the odor in, in the model. And then if it detects the odor, it does a kind of the, the classic search, cast a search, which I'll show you, and, and, it gets, and it gets trapped. But the probability that it traps falls off with distance from the source. And, and we can change all these parameters, but what I'm about to tell you doesn't really make much difference. Um, so here's, here's a case. This is what we call sort of the death star. I keep the star um, a case where the flies are just take a random heading. And, and these would be the results that we would get. And there's a bias towards the upwind traps, which, which is not what we see. Um, and, and so, and, and this is summarizes the results of that simulation. So here's another simulation where we sort of bias the flies downwind. And, and this reproduces the sorts of distributions that we see in the real data. Again, you know, we're in the case of sort of doing thousands and thousands of simulations with all sort of parameters, but this is sort of one of the things that, he, that, he, that emerges. And this already is pretty interesting, because if you know this literature, you know, if, if there's an idea that if you're hungry and you're searching for something that's windborne, you should fly upwind, because if you detect something, that's where it's coming from. The other notion is, no, you should go crosswind. Because then you're going, to inter you're going to intercept plumes more frequently. But what we're finding is that flies are actually going, um, going downwind, right? Um, and, 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 and I should say, I mean, it just gives you some intuition. I mean, the, what happens if you go randomly, the reason why you didn't, don't get caught at downwind traps is because you hit the plumes of upwind traps first. And then you make your way up, right? And, and, and so whereas if, if we have this kind of bias, you know, you can get to the downwind traps. Of course, then you have to work your way against the wind a long way back up. But this appears to be what the flies, the, 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 the flies are doing. So these are very, very, very early days. 
But you know, we're pretty excited that these experiments even work at all, and now we can do much more interesting geometries and so forth. Yeah. Um, the wind speed is approximately their flight speed of about uh, six kilometers per hour. It varies a lot in the site, so every time we do the experiment, but it's usually between six and 30, <laughs> but we can't do the experiments when it's like 30 kilometers an hour. So, no, no, well, it, it, they, 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 they don't take off when it's that windy, right? Yeah. Um, uh, okay, so I mean, these are all great questions. I just want to get to th some. So, so one of the things, assumptions I've been making is that they fly in straight lines. Now, why do I think they fly in straight lines? I mean, there's a number of different arguments. It's hard to fly in a straight line. These aren't flies, these are humans, okay? These are humans walking with burlap sacks over their head on big open fields. And, 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 and when, if you do this, you'll, you'll walk in circles. It'll drive you crazy because you won't know you're walking in circle, but you actually walk in circle. And it's just a, it's kind of an interesting highlight of how important sensory cues are to be able to fly straight. So in the middle of that vast landscape, how to fly, fly straight. Well, we know a little bit about this because even when there's no sun in the sky, there's a pattern of polarized light in the sky that comes from Raleigh scattering um, and that, that makes a coherent <clears throat> pattern of, of light polarization because when the photons from the sun hit the atmosphere, they, they get reflected, and the angle at which they get reflected relative to the direction of path sets the degree of polarization. And, and you, you know, you, you f do all the geometry, and you have this very coherent pattern that's maximally polarized in the equator between the sun and anti-sun axis. And insects, again, Devonian toolkit, you know, they have been looking up at the sky for you know 500 million years, so they have all of this hardware for detecting polarized light. Um, and, and this special region called the dorsal rim, which flies have. And, um, and, and we've been work Peter Weir in the lab has been working on this, doing two photon imaging, showing that there is a map of, of, of polarized light orientation across the dorsal rim. And this lines up very much with, with beautiful work from Uwe Hamburg's lab in, in Locus, um, that there's a, a, a central map in a region called the central complex. So, so flies, you know, if, if they could, could use this information, they could use it to keep a, a maintain a compass heading. And Peter did some experiments years ago with this really fancy experiment, uh, a fancy device we were able to build within the laboratory, uh, which you can see right there, which is what we call a magno tether. So a magno tether is a fly a glued to a, a pin. The pin is oriented between the north and south facing uh, 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 surface of a magnet with a camera underneath that can track the the angular orientation of the body. So the fly is fixed in space, but it can choose its orientation. We can have either a glass lid or various filters, like circular polarizing filters and so forth. We can take this outside and see what the fly does to just a natural sky. And so here's a sped up 10 times movie of a 24 minute experiment. And you're looking at the sort of the rear end of a male fly. Um, and the fly is maintaining an orientation um, that's very stable within the, 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 the uh, coordinate system of the arena. And then every three minutes, indicated by these gray patches, Peter rotates the arena by 90 degrees in world coordinates. And the fly at that moment rotates in arena coordinates. And, and, and so the purpose of that perturbation is easier if I just should have show you the time series. So this is what the experiment, this is what the data look like in arena coordinates, but if you rewrap it to world coordinates, this fly was maintaining a westward heading for 24 minutes, which based on our new data would you know, take it three kilometers roughly in the same direction. So if, when the sun, of course, is available, the sun is a, is a really potent signal, and, and we, we can do the same trick with another sort of, of flight simulator that uh, Isabel Geraldo was using in the laboratory that's you know, just a little tiny, very bright dot that moves, but the fly can control in closed loop by regulating its wing motion, and the fly will maintain a heading relative to that, to, to that sun. And this is not flying towards the sun, because the fly will often pick an arbitrary heading and just maintain it. So this is something we call proportional navigation that's a lot more sophisticated than just phototaxis, because you know, at one time it might choose you know, east by northeast and another by south, southwest. Um, and the, the, you know, this is a great proportional navigation is known. It's how you, know, you can have a, 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 an air-to-air -air missile can hit an aircraft. It's how beetles, um, tiger beetles, uh, 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 capture their prey. Dragonflies capture their prey. And it's why moths spiral into flames, because they're trying to orient to the moon. But unfortunately, they've picked an object that is not the moon, an object that they get close to. So again, this is a very, very ancient behavior within insects. And, and the reason why we're sort of more interested in sun 
fixation right now is because it's a slightly more robust behavior, possibly because we can just reconstruct the stimulus more easily. So we can do an experiment where we let a fly pick a heading, we stop it for five minutes and let it go again and see if it picks the same heading or does it choose a new heading. Um, and we can kind of, we analyze this by analyzing the vector strength, which is sort of the, the, the addition of all the, 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 the unitary headings over time. Um, and we can plot the, um, the, the, the heading um, af, of the first, ex, the first flight against the second height. And we, we, we plot the heading twice to, to just emphasize that these are circularly distributed data. And, and the correlation is very, very strong. And if you take sort of the, 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 the mean absolute value and difference of the data compared to a scrambled um, uh, distribution by sort of pairing the data from all the different flies, you get a very, very, very highly significant result that the flies remembered their heading across five minutes of no flight. They remember it off of two hours of no flight, but they start to forget it over six hours. And since flies have an activity period of about four hours, this would mean that if they, once they choose a heading, they would keep that heading for you know, basically the whole day. Um, so I just want to say a little bit, because I know this is probably what people are going to ask me questions about this, because there's been a lot of fantastic work from um, Vivek J. Raman and Gabby Maiman and Tanya Wolf um, on the so-called compass system of the central complex. So there's cells within the, the brain of the fly in the ellipsoid body that is thought to be, represent the azimuthal sort of orientation of the fly. And this is from just a summary that, um, that the Turner Evans and, 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 and Jay Raman did. And, and so you might ask the question, what are these compass cells doing during the sun fixation paradigm? And, and this is what they're doing, that the representation, the angular orientation of the sun is being mapped internally in this toroidal neuropil within the fly. So we're pretty excited about sort of chasing down um, this, this circuitry. And now I want to get back to, to, to another topic, which is getting back to odors. What are the flies attracted to? So I'm telling you, we just put treetop apple juice and yeast. Um, and we've done ex very, very simple uh, preference experiments that if you put apple juice or any juice with yeast um, and you measure the, the production of CO2 and the production of ethanol over time, flies like the, the ferment when CO2 production is maximal. Um, and this kind of makes sense. So if you look at the, 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 the common features, you know, chemical products of fermentation, CO2 and ethanol really stand out because of the very high vapor pressure and they're very, very light. So for a cue that's gonna carry a long distance, there's really what you'd expect you, 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 you'd wanna choose. Okay, but of course, you, know, you have to pay attention to the literature, right? And there's certain, you know, now with all these open source, like fantastic things like BioArchive, you can get information very quickly. Of course, my favorite one is Reddit. And uh, we came across this paper and read it a few years ago. Okay, our house has a fruit fly problem. Found this in the airlock today. So this is somebody brewing. So these are all dead fruit flies. And then the, 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 the thread is kind of humid. Yep, they're attracted to CO2 because it's released by rotting fermenting fruit. Unfortunately, this makes them a really common vector for infection since they carry acidobacter. I would postpone any further brewing until you get the shit under control. Okay, right. So... Um, also, a fly guy here, building on that, you Golden Death said they actually show avoidance to CO2 because it's commonly used in aversion learning studies. Here's a recent paper on avoidance behavior, the attraction. So, so this is just highlighting a fact that within the literature, there is a, 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 a series of papers, mostly in very high profile journals, starting with this paper from David Anderson, Seymour Benzer, <coughs> um, <coughs> Um, I'm sorry, and, and, and Richard Oxel, um, showing that flies um, are aversive to CO2, okay? And, and Leslie has done, you know, beautiful stuff isolating the, the, the receptor that's responsible for that aversion. Um, and, and I, you know, this, I, I can't go into all the papers, but they're all like sort of solid papers, maybe with an interpretation that I'll, that I'll question. Um, th there is some complexity. So Sarah Wasserman and Mark Fry's lab did some experiments with tethered flies and claimed that, well, walking flies avoid CO2, but tethered flying flies seem to be attracted to CO2, but, but they got a lot of pushback on this paper. Um, so so it's, very, it's very, very confusing. Um, and also just remember, we just for kicks and giggles decided, well, you know, how much, like what are flies living in? If, 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 if I mean, the idea in the original ben, uh, uh, Anderson ex experiment, um, Tristram uh, mentioned this idea of a Shrek stuff. That's something that a stressed animal gives off that other animals can respond to. And that was the idea that CO2 is the Shrek stuff. 
So if it is, flies are freaking out because they are living, a typical fly bottle, they're living at like 1% CO2, which is kind of interesting to think about it if, if it is a Shrek stuff. But the other problem is that if you look at insects broadly, you know, pretty much any insect that's been tested for CO2 is attracted to CO2. So it seems to me, and it's what life smells like, right? In a sense. Um, okay, so we, we've been studying this problem for a while. And, and, and so initially we did this in a wind tunnel and we have a, 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 a nice calibrated wind tunnel um, where we can uh, calibrate an odor plume. And these initial experiments I'm gonna show you work with a laminar odor plume where we can use a, a, a robot attached to a PID that maps the, the, the plume in space. Um, and then we put the flies in the flight arena. And I'm not going to talk about this, but flies do this, the classic uh, a surge and cast behavior um, where they sort of follow the envelope of the plume over time for, for minutes um, or, or hours. Um, at, at one point I did want to make, because I just think it's kind of interesting in the context of you know, turbulence and so forth, that what one of the claims we try to make in that paper is that really the, the time history of the fly's experience is not as determined by the, 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 the odor structure of the plume, but by its flight dynamics, because the fly keeps zipping in and out of the plume. And that's what's really driving the fact that you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't get any odor for a long, long time. And it's not because there wasn't, not because the packets in the plume are moving, but because it's just way out here. Um, so the locomotor dynamics are, are important. But the take home message is flies do the classic uh, cast and surge. So, one final thing I want to say, though, about this is that we found that when a fly uh, uh, comes across an attractive odor in the plume, it becomes attracted to visual objects, even when it comes out of the plume. For about 10 minutes after getting an attractive odor, it will be attracted to little black uh, uh, projected circles on, on the arena. And I can kind of show you that a little more convincingly in this animation. So I'm sorry, this is animation of data. It's not a simulation. And these are not all traces that were done at the same time. I'm just overlaying them you know, so you can get, get an impression. So these are flies that are flying around. There's odor here. There's no odor down here at the bottom of the tunnel. But you can see that these flies all get attracted to these, this visual object. And there's no odor there. It's just a black projected object. Um, no, 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 no. These are, as I said, these are all, I'm just kind of compositing all that so you can see it very easily. But I'll show you a heat map. So we have our you know, Eiffel Tunnel. Um, but now these are different experiments to get the CO2 problem. So what we have is a little platform that the CO2 or other odors oozes from, and we track the flies, and then they can land on the platform, and then we can later track them, as I'll show you. So here's just, I think, roughly 40,000 trajectories in each, in each um, uh, experiment, but this is just a heat map. So in ethanol, you can see that the, 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 you know, the flies are really attracted to this platform, and they show this, this, you know, this high activity around this dark spot, right? And so we see exactly the same thing with CO2. So the CO2, the flies are, are very, very attracted to the CO2. They're not attracted to just, say, a, a, a H2O plume. And we can quantify it you know, by measuring where each trajectory goes, the approaches to the pad, landing on the pad, approaching the dark spot. But, but clearly, um, both CO2 and ethanol are attractive to the flies. Um, so Mark, Mark Fry you know, proposed in, in, in this paper these enigmatic experiments, or you know, Sarah's paper. The idea was, well, maybe um, we know that, that flying um, during flight, uh, there's high octopamine levels in the fly, um, but not when they're walking. Um, and so maybe you know, that could explain things. Um, so what we wanted to do was to do an experiment where we could kind of track the fly coming in and then test it like, while it was on the ground. Um, and so we built a slightly different pad that has a machine vision system so we could track what the fly did once it landed. But you can see that the flies are still attracted to the CO2 as to the ethanol after they land. And that can be quantified a bunch of different ways in terms of the time on platform, distance traveled, approaches to odor source, and so forth. OK. Um, now, I know what you're all thinking, or some of you are thinking, this is all a concentration effect. It's all a matter of what concentration you use. This is not a matter of what concentration you use. You can use any concentration, including 100% CO2. The flies are attracted to the CO2. They land on the pad, and then they die. OK, so these are just two little dead flies that, that, that killed themselves uh, going towards the, the fly. So 
at this point, we, we, we needed a way of, of doing this much more systematically. So we, we go back to a pure walking chamber, but one where we can collect data over a long period of times. And just to convince skeptics, so here, here's a chamber that has a perforated floor and a perforated top. And when this will turn to red, uh, CO2 will sort of ooze out very gently out from the floor of the chamber. You know, and some of it will spread a little bit in the chamber. Most will just come out through the ceiling. But you'll see what the flies do when, when the CO2 comes on. So I, I don't know what else to call that but attraction. So, um, so, so but, but the way we set these up, we're able to, t to have the same flies in the same chamber for 24 hours. And you see these patterns of activity. And, and so th this is important because it, th this is the slide where like, the people who published before, they're, they're right in, in a certain context. Because in, you know, in the afternoon when flies are not active and night when flies are not active. So these are, these are data looking at the number of flies you know, at the CO2 or the test odor compared to the number of flies over the control odor during the afternoon at dusk, night, and dawn. And, and at dusk, when flies are actively foraging, they're attracted to CO2. Um, in the afternoon, when they're sort of in siesta mode, they, they avoid, they, they sort of slightly avoid CO2. Um, and sort of similar results at, at dawn and night. So maybe this is all explained by circadian rhythm. So if we, and, and this is all the clean air controls, um, but if you starve the flies before putting them in, basically that makes them more active because they've got to find food. They're much, you know, they, they don't go into as much of a, of, a, of a siesta at night. And you see that they're attracted to CO2 at night. So it's not circadian time per se, it seems to be activity. And this, I think, is the real secret to maybe why the literature is a little bit confusing, because CO2 in many experiments is often delivered at a high flow rate. But as shown by many labs, including David Anderson's lab, insects tend to not to slow down, become inactive in, 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 when, when, when subjected to high flow, because you know, they could get blown away. It makes most sense. However, if we take that, so, so this, we, we modified our chamber to really kind of blast, not really blast, but we increased the flow rate by a factor of about five. And now the CO2 becomes aversive. However, if we cut the aristae off so they can't detect the high flow rate, they're attractive again. Or if we do the high flow rate, but we, we heat the crap out of them so that they're really active, CO2 is attractive again. And, and so this was sort of the secret um, this is probably the most important for the sort of CO2 story. This is just a whole bunch of experiments that's parsed according to the mean locomotor rate before we present the odor from, from, from low you know, uh, uh, centimeters per second uh, velocity to high velocity. Um, and then as you go along, you can, in each one of those experiments, you can calculate a sort of preference index. Were they attracted to the CO2 or aversive to the CO2 and color code that? Um, and you can kind of do the statistics and you get a sort of a nice linear regression of this preference index as a function of velocity, or you can just sort of parse the data that, you know, below a certain velocity, you can look at their responses. Remember, this is the pre-stimulus velocity, or above a certain pre, uh, ve uh, 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 velocity, they're attracted. So in the same, basically, population, we can either see attraction or aversion depending upon the activity rate of the animal. And then this is really for aficionados like Leslie, um, because now that we kind of know how to, how to see attraction and aversion in the same animals in a, in a cohesive way, we can start to go back and see, you know, try to chase down the receptor. And the important results is that the receptors that people thought were responsible for aversion are, but they're not responsible for attraction. And you know, these are just very kind of, um, intermediate preliminary, but so far we've sort of chased it to um, one of the IRs that's a co-receptor, so they, it functions, thought to function with another re receptor, a, a protein. But if we get rid of this, the flies are aversive, but they don't show attraction. So it doesn't look like the same receptor is used for the two behaviors, but the two behaviors use a different reception. So the, the other, I just want to say two things about this. One, um, I, I mean, I don't, it's bad to say ill of somebody who left the conference early, but, but, but Bill made you know, this comment that maybe everything in the fly brain is parsed into like you know, attractive, aversive, attractive, aversive, and that's all mapped in the lateral horn. I think, I think, I think flies are smarter than that. I think they have the ability to see the same odor as, as attractive or aversive under different contexts, and I think there's other evidence in the literature that supports that. Another thing 
Um, and this relates to a giant ecological model that I'm not going to have time to talk about. But what this is plotting is the number of flies on the platform you know, that landed on the platform that had CO2. After a while, they start to go away. And, and, and that extinction curve is, 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 is indicated here. They do the same thing for ethanol, but they extinct at a, at, at a, at a slower rate. These are the same data collected in this internal chamber that is sort of once the CO2 turns on, they all get excited about it, but then they, they slowly, it doesn't become aversive, but it's just not interesting. But this totally makes sense. Like you smell something and you look in and after a while, it's like, I'm, you know, I'm screw this. There's, there's nothing here, right? And, and that decision is made earlier for CO2 than it is for ethanol, but that makes complete sense because the environment is full of lots of false signals of, eth of, of, of CO2, much fewer false signals of, of, of ethanol. There's really nothing but yeast out there making ethanol. And if I forgot to say this, flies are yeast abhors, right? That's the whole deal. Um, okay, so why should they avoid CO2? I, I, you know, with all due respect, I don't believe the Shrek stuff hypothesis. The reason, very simple, flies are um, tracheates that, that store CO2 in, in internal tubes in their body until it accumulates. And when they breathe, they give out big pulses of CO2. That's how they breathe. And this is why I think if you vortex flies, you get CO2. So I, I don't see any way that like CO2 could be used as a stress signal because every time a fly took a breath, it would be interpreted as a fly freaking out, right? So I just don't think it would work. OK, then the, the, why do they avoid CO2? There's two hypotheses we come up with. One is the volcano hypothesis. Now, as crazy as it is, there's a literature on this, that, 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 that entomologists have found cases in, in geological areas where there's massive insect die-offs because of, of, of an increase in the out. I mean, this has also killed cross-country skiers in, you know, in, in places, that, that CO2 activity increases, and all these insects get attracted to it, and then they die. So there could be some aversion for natural sources of CO2. I, I think this is a little nutty, but it just should be mentioned because there's a literature on it. I think a much more likely hypothesis is the parasite hypothesis. That if you're trying to find, you know, if, 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 if CO2 is what life smells like and you're a fly and you go after the CO2 and you're something that likes to lay your eggs in the fly or its eggs or its pupae or its larvae, why don't you go after CO2 as well? Um, and when I said that, you know, somebody asked me, how do you know they're your flies on the traps? Well, we don't ever collect fruit flies in Coyote Lake, but we collect a crap load of stuff, and almost all of them are parasites. So you saw in the middle of that wasteland, these are just sort of a small number of these little tiny insects that we collect. Um, so I, I think that basically, you know, when flies are quiescent and they're not actively foraging, they don't need to be near CO2. They don't want to be near CO2 because you know, the, the parasites could come get you. So that's our kind of best hypothesis. So how much time do I have left? Um, like five minutes? Okay. Oh. Um, <clears throat> um, now I wish I hadn't cut those 20 sides. No. Um, so, so I want to I wanna, uh, talk about another thing that is like so... Pr I mean, I'm kind of cheating because this doesn't relate to odor except in a, a way that it does. Um, but this is in the context of narrow search. So now we're at a very, very different spatial scale. So you know, the, the fly has you know, possibly flown kilometers, zipped around searching, and I didn't have a time to talk about that aspect. But it, it makes a decision to land, and, and, and now it's looking for food. What does it do? Well, um, you know, a, a guy who I've, I've admired a real long time is Vincent Dutier. Uh, Vincent Dutier published a, a, a book called The Hungry Fly and a, and a charming book called To Know a Fly, and one of the phenomena that he described, and he, 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 you know, he was just basically a fly whisperer who was really a pioneer in sort of invertebrate neuroethology back in the, in, in the, in the 50s, but, but, but he would take house flies and, and then pick them up and give them some sugar and then put them back down and then dr draw what they did. And they did these kind of crazy loopy things that he called dances, and he called them dances because they reminded him of the crazy loopy things that honeybees did when they come back to the hive. And, and he didn't use the, tr the term lightly. He, was, he, he actually proposed that it was the same like ancient behavioral module of like what an in insect does after it gets rewarded by food. Now, I actually think that specifically, that's nutty. But generally, it's brilliant. Because I think he was a very, very early 
pioneer in this idea that there could, you could observe behaviors in, in radically you know, disparate species that actually went back to some core ancient, you know, the Devonian toolkit. So I, I have enormous admiration. Um, Bell looked at this in fruit flies a, a, a couple of decades ago, but again, not with technology that I think made it possible to figure out mechanistically what's going on. So Irene T Kim took on this project in the laboratory, and I just want to show you some, some movies um, of, of this. Um, so here's a hungry fly, fly and, and walking around in a dinner plate. This is sped up a little bit. This is sort of the, the timer. Um, there's a yummy yeast paste drop in the middle of the arena. So this fly is hungry. Okay, point number one, it takes an excruciatingly long time for the fly to find the damn food. It's like standing behind the person in line and then they like lose their wallet and you're like, you know, you, you just, it's just, okay, this is moments after the fly has finally found the food. Okay, this is, that same fly, that's what it does. Okay, so this is this thing that Vincent de Tier called the dance and the referees of the paper didn't allow us to call it the dance, which I think was really unfortunate. What's that? No, 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 I, I wasn't, it's, I, um, so, so this is just looking at lots of data. It, it, you can do this in, in, in complete darkness and they still do the dance. You can by a number of different ways test whether odor is involved and using, you know, sucrose, using mutants, although the mutants are somewhat problematic for reasons I can get into for aficionados. Um, but I'll show you a more convincing experiment in a moment. And, and an interesting thing, one idea is maybe the flies are laying down a trail so you can get rid of the uh, 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 hy hydrocarbon glands, these enocytes that, that females have, um, that, that would be the most obvious things that they would sort of lay down some sort of track. And in fact, the dances, if anything, get super strong if you, if you get rid of, of, of their ability to lay pheromones. In fact, I just, it's so, it's so amazing. I just want to show you the results of that. Oh yeah, experiment. So so again, this is a fly that has a genetically ablated enocytes, which are um, epithelial cells that can secrete um, hydrocarbons that are used in, in in signaling. So again, you know the excruciating weight for the fly. And and if olfaction is so important, why doesn't the fly find the food? Okay. So this is the dance right after. It's just, it's just crazy um, to me. Um, okay, so I hope some of you are still not convinced. I mean, what we're trying to make the argument for is that this is entirely idiothetic, that the fly is doing this because of, you know, keeping track of internal motor commands or sensory, uh, you know, uh, 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 mechanosensory information. So, of course, what you want to do is the disappearing food trick or the sliding food trick. So. Here we create an arena where the food is on a little strip and the fly can find it and it starts to dance and then we sort of, you know, we, we move the food to a different part of the chamber. It's a difficult experiment to do because flies have such great mechanosensory capabilities that they, they tend to get disturbed by the sliding. But nevertheless, it, it still works. So here, um, and there's something just ridiculously amusing about these. And these are done in the dark as most of our experiments are. So, Again, you know, there's a long wait while, you know, the person, like, looks for their, key, their, their wallet and forgets they need bananas. Okay, it finds the food, and then you'll, you'll see the dance. Okay, and then you kind of have to wait until the fly, and then, boop, see, it was moved over there. And the fly continues to, 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 to do the dance. Um, and I should, there's lots of features I'm kind of skipping out that the, the, the dance, the loops of the dance get, get further out over time um, and, and, and so forth. So um, <clears throat> this, okay, this is just, okay, this is the last trajectory, but it's also kind of cool. Um, this is a case where the fly finds the food in the new location. Um, and uh, so it's got to find the food. Come on. Come on, okay, there it finds food. And then it, it'll do the dance, and then we'll move the slider, and then this is just a, a fly, you know, about 30% of the flies do find the food in the new location, and then you'll see, like, what it does immediately afterwards. Um, okay, boop, the, the, the food's moved, it dances around the old spot, 
Oh, finds a new food. And now it starts to dance around the new food. So, you know, whatever the food is done, it's just like reset this homing vector. Um, and, and so these are so the, the yeah, <laughs> that's right. So this is just a series of experiments and these papers out. I mean, it, 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 but you know, the point is, this is, the, you know, the the, the searches, are, the, the behavior is still centered even after you've moved the food. So it can't be that they're going back to it because of the odor, because it's the you know it's somewhere else now. Um, and then just for you know the mathematicians, you know, this is the analysis. Like, could it just be monkeys and typewriters? So we take all the statistics of the path lengths the turns, the turn angles, and, and you, know, you, can, you can create any model um, based on the, the locomotor statistics, and, and you just can never recreate um, dances that are centered around the food. You know, so so that there's no random, you know, easy random walk model that, that, could explain, that could explain the behavior. Another analysis that we've done is if we plot the distance to the food over time, you see this sort of periodic thing because it's going back to the food. And so if you do a, a autocovariance uh, analysis of that, you see these sort of like side bands that indicate there's a periodicity that you never see in the like random data. Um, and that's kind of interesting because it, it, you know, it would suggest that the flies have some sort of timer. And OK, so those who are insect aficionados will know that cataglyphus, you know, this desert ant, has this amazing path integration ability where it can leave the nest, go out looking for food, find the food, and go exactly back. And this is like the first great evidence, classic evidence that flies, I mean, I mean flies, the ants um, have this idiosetic path integrator, you know, the classic work of Rudiger Vayner. And then Matthias Wittlinger did these amazing experiments where he glued ants, glued stilts to ants so that after they found the food, they thought they traveled further than they did. I mean, or you can see, so you screw up the idiothetic sense and they overshoot or undershoot depending upon whether you, you glue them to stilts or you make little stubbies by cutting half their legs off. So we, we think that you know, this is part of the Devonian toolkit that, that Drosophila can do this as well. So the fly finds food and now it's sort of keeping track of its orientation and heading and then at a certain point it says, okay, now I've got to go back, um, now I'll go out again, um, come back, go out again, and so forth. So I think the interesting thing to me that relates to odor, can bring this back to odor, is that it, it really was excruciating that the fly had such a hard time finding, you know, it's like favorite food. It's like, you know, caviar in the middle of this dish. But I think it actually makes sense because I think that there's no, there's no plume because there's no, we're not, we don't have advection, um, within that chamber. So it has to rely purely on diffusion. And I think flies are just really crappy about doing that. I think, and, and then I think it's just really actually, it's, it's, it's kind of harder to do, to do chemotaxis, you know, once you're here than it is once you're in, 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 in the air, which is why I think that the fly, like once it finds the food, there's been really strong selection to like remember where it is because, you know, so it, I'm not saying that like animals don't need noses. I mean, my whole point is that What's really cool, I mean, there's something cooler than like a fly, a you know, flying animal, but you put a nose on that flying animal and then you have just an amazing thing. But, you know, there, there, there are limits depending upon, you know, upon the physics and so forth. Um, and I guess the other thing I have to say, maybe this is more for discussion, I, I think one, one thing that this, I hope this work points out is that all these behaviors, although they re rely on olfaction, they also involve you know, mechanoreception and, and vision. And, you know, as sort of a sensory motor person, um, you know, I think sometimes it's a little dangerous to sort of like only focus on one sensory modality because, you know, from the animal's behavior, uh, from animal's perspective, like, you know, it's squeezing all the sensory information from the world, you know, like blood from a turnip. Um, and sometimes you'll, you know, there are interesting interactions between olfaction and other, and other senses. Um, but anyway, that's basically it. And um, uh, again, I want to I want to highlight the the people Kate, who in a very short period of time has like gotten these Coyote Lake experiments to do, which is just really amazing. Floris van Bruegel has been chasing down the CO two story for several years now, and I think you can get a sense of just how hard it was to figure out what was going on. And and Irene Kim, 
um, did, did the work on the, um, on, on the dances. So thanks. <clears throat>